And welcome. You are watching and listening to the Financial Survival Network. I'm Kerry Lutz. It's 52521. Well, transitory inflation. If ever there was a focus group term that means absolutely nothing, expresses nothing, and you learn absolutely nothing from, it's transitory inflation. Because the last time I looked, life itself is transitory. So you're living a transitory life in a transitory economy and in a transitory global financial system that just happens to be suffering from transitory inflation, whatever that means. Well, you can be the judge of that. I'd like to get your opinion. Send us your emails to kl at kerrylutz.com. Right now, our good friend from tfmetalsreport.com is with us, Craig Hempke, aka Turd Ferguson. And uh, we should probably stop using that. Everybody knows who you are at this point who you care about uh, knowing, having them know you. But anyway, Craig, uh, it's great to have you back. So transitory, you know, this is a pure, a pure creation of Fed speak, is it not? Yeah, yeah. And I, I suppose it leads to a discussion of whether it's uh, that inflation is here to stay or not. And we should probably go there next. But I think what few people understand, at least from my reading on Twitter and every place else, Everybody gets so focused on, you know, the Fed trying to say inflation is transitory, but nobody has really focused yet upon why they're saying it. And Carrie, I know you and I always get together in January each year to talk about my annual forecast. And as you know, the last couple of them have been pretty good. And this year's forecast of higher prices was in large part based upon the eventual imposition of yield curve control, where the Fed... And basically, you know how they always used to talk about a Fed put in the stock market? You know, the Fed's in there buying the stock market if it ever falls or the exchange stabilization fund, all that stuff. It's actually a Fed put in the bond market. Because for any one of a number of reasons, the U.S. cannot afford higher interest rates. And in the past, we have historical precedent of this, the Fed has instituted yield curve control to get, star I should say, sharply and steeply negative real interest rates where you know the nominal interest rate of say 1% is exceeded by the inflation rate of 3 or 4% so you're actually guaranteed to lose money every year you basically inflate away the debt and that's where they're headed okay but here's the thing the last thing the fed's going to do is wake up some morning on a wednesday and say we hereby decree that we shall not allow interest rates to exceed 2% right because if that happens and rates go through 2%, well, then what do they have, right? That's like the final tool in the toolbox. So instead, they're going to walk us there gradually. And this is what I wrote about back in January. It starts with job owning, which is what the Fed always wants to do. They just want to go out and talk and say things and see if they can get the market to do what they want them to do. That's like what the Fed does with every FOMC meeting and Powell press conference and all these Fed goons that they roll out on a daily basis, you know, to do their little calls and their speeches. It starts with job owning. Then it's then from there it begins to, you know, maybe some policy adjustments and stuff like that. And then from there, eventually, if they don't get what they respond to, they actually have to do something. Well, the first step in yield curve control is job owning. And the first step of job owning is the use of the word transitory. Because what is Powell trying to do? He's trying to convince bond investors to not freak out and sell. And he's trying to get them to continue to buy U.S. Treasuries at a yield less than 2%. Well, if inflation is 3 or 4% and it's here to stay, ain't nobody going to pay take a bond at 2%, right? Or a note at 2% because you're guaranteeing yourself a loss of purchasing power every year. But if the Fed can tell you uh, that inflation is transitory and help you to feel better about it, then maybe you'll keep buying. And it's in fact, it's working. Our 10-year treasury is down to 1.6. So that's what transitory is. It's a first step toward yield curve control. Yeah, so negative interest rates, uh, really nothing new there. Negative real interest rates, that's what we're really talking about. Yep. They haven't yep. actually gone negative, but they're next to nothing. And uh, God only knows how much money is going out the door at the Fed to prop up banks and such. I mean, we really need to talk about the, the repo market again, because when it started in September 19th, I said then there's something really major wrong with the financial system 
because the repo market, that's where they put the C and the D team, team. You know, the guy at the repo desk is like a guy who is going nowhere, but he's a little bit too well-educated to be cleaning the floors and they can't fire them because they're basically socialist institutions. So they got to make a place, a home for this person. And it's like, okay, we'll put them at the repo desk. They can't do a lot of harm there because who cares <laughs> about repos? It's like you, they call you, they say, we got a billion uh, treasury bonds. Uh, can we get 800 million? And he's, he's programmed to say yes. Yeah. Or yeah. it's he's calling them up saying, we got a billion dollars. Uh, do you got any treasuries for me? And that's how the market worked for like 100 years. It was like the dumbest division of the bank. And it made a, a guaranteed profit, not much, but they could hyper hypothecate and they could lever up that profit. And then all of a sudden, JP Morgan Chase pulls out, pulls the rug out from underneath it. And if anybody knows uh, borrowers who are not worthy who they are, it's JP Morgan Chase, right? And, and, you know, the repo market expanded to allow hedge funds to, uh, to hawk their wares and a whole bunch of other non-bank entities. REITs. Right, REITs, mm -hmm. all these other ones. And then JP Morgan wakes up and says, hold on a second, this isn't like, uh, it's not like we're loaning a 10 billion over to Bank of, uh, Bank of America or to uh, Wells Fargo. This is different. This is not a market we wanna be in. We're not getting paid enough for risk. And what happened? The rate goes from like, uh, you know, 60 basis points to eight to 10% overnight, which shows pure financial pandemonium and who steps in the Fed to bring order to a disorderly market. And we're having trouble again. Uh, the, the size of the overnight uh, reverse repos at this point are the, some of the largest we've seen in history. A lot of times uh, that gaps up at quarter end as banks try to fiddle around with their balance sheets, you know, to kind of gloss them up uh, for the end of the quarter. They mark everything to market. All of a sudden this week, I mean, actually being last week, the amount of reverse repo was spiking. And it, I think as, as I can read it, it's a sign that uh, a lot of the banks and the primary dealer banks are about as stuffed with reserves as they can, as they can get. Uh, it, it may have led to the Fed inserting a little language in the FOMC minutes last week to make it sound like they were actually thinking about tapering, even though Powell, at the time the last FOMC, said, no, we're not even talking about thinking about wondering about tapering. So all of a sudden, this language shows up last week. Um, yeah, there's, there's a lot of interesting stuff going on, you know, deep within the plumbing that, you know, we're just not privy to. What it does set us up, though, for, Kerry, is a very interesting month of June. Uh, the next FOMC meeting, the one in June, usually is rather significant because you're halfway through the year anyway. So if the Fed is going to announce anything or not announce anything, uh, it's all going to come out in three weeks uh, when we get this next FOMC meeting. I very much look forward to seeing what they say. We've already seen, you know, I was talking about yield curve control earlier. We've already seen something very interesting get snuck in about I guess it was a week ago last Friday. What was that, the 14th of May? You know, like a lot of times the White House will dump something at five o'clock on a Friday, you know, because nobody will catch it. And then the weekend will go by and it won't be news anymore. Well, all of a sudden the Fed put out something a week ago last Friday, said that they were going to begin to shift what's called the weighted average maturity of their quantitative easing program. And what that means is they're currently focused on buying up mainly short term bills and notes, things like under two and three and four year maturity, really short term stuff. Well, that is crowding out a lot of uh, demand from other entities that want that short term paper. And it's in the verge of driving interest rates below zero. In fact, in the last four weeks, we've had four one month treasury bill auctions that printed at 0.000%. Just nothing. Here, here's my million dollars. Just give it back to me. I don't want any interest to give it back to me in a month. Okay, so the Fed is now adjusting that average maturity out from buying, you know, one-year uh, bills or two-year notes out to more five-year and seven-year and 10-year notes, increasing the demand on the longer end. And again, if you can increase demand, that's your next step for holding back 
interest rates on the long end, that yield curve control. So there's a lot going on, man. This next FOMC meeting in June is going to be really interesting. And in the meantime, I think we see gold continue to progress higher. Yeah. Um, we caught it coming out of that double bottom back in March. It was perfectly logical. Once it broke down through 1780, it was probably going to go to 1680 because that was the range it was in this time last year. But then as it rallied back up off that double bottom, it got above its 50-day moving average uh, in middle part of April. And at that point, price was 1750. Well, here's something interesting, Kerry. We're currently in a bull market. I think anybody can see that. And we have been in this latest run since late 2018. Well, in 2019, there were two separate occurrences where price rallied and then pulled back in a consolidation, a, a chartist might call it a flag pattern, broke down below its 50 day moving average and traded there for about 90 days, twice in 2019. But then once it got back above the 50 day moving average, there were, it happened again twice. The first move was 19%. The second time it happened, it was 13%. And both of those breakthroughs above that 50 day the, the rally lasted about, oh, 80 or 90 days. So when we caught this in the middle of April, I thought, well, why wouldn't we expect, say, a 15% rally from here? Then uh, maybe early part of July. And again, take 1750 and add 10%, we're talking 2000. So we're clearly on track. I think the macro stuff that we just were talking about uh, with yield curve control and the Fed and all the other stuff that's going on, I think puts us on track. And so I think we are still set to rally all through next month. Hey, uh, my friend Nick Santiago in the money stocks.com nailed that one totally. He called the bottom right at like, I think it was 1686 or something like that. Cool. And he called that a W pattern. And oh, yeah, I did that. Yeah, that is about what it looked like on the chart. It had a double bottom. Yeah. And, a, and probably one of the most uh, powerful patterns. They don't always work. So you, you can't just say, I see a pattern and then go go all in because it might not work. You have to look at other factors, but here it was very clear what was happening because they they hit those two bottoms that barely lasted for a couple of hours yeah. and then they were back over 1700. Right now we're a hair's breadth from 1900 as we speak. Yep. And and uh, nothing that's going on in the world uh, gives us any indication uh, that things are are going to change here, Craig? That it, that that we won't see two thousand dollar gold, right? And in, inflation is here to stay. This this transitory stuff again. That's just jawboning by the Fed trying to keep bond investors happy and to keep them to continue buying. Um, but it's here to stay. There, if if uh, for anybody watching, if you've ever taken an economics class or learned anything about economics, where you're taught in a kind of a classical sense, is there's two sources. Uh, that drive inflation, typically. Uh, one is a what's called cost push, where input costs rise, the manufacturer has to shoulder the, the cost of those, and then has to pass those along to the consumer in the form of higher prices. Otherwise, the manufacturer's margins get squeezed, and they eventually could go out of business. Well, what are input costs these days? Well, let's see, copper's at all-time highs, lumber's gone up three or four times, and oh, no, now it's pulling back. Uh, agricultural commodities, geez, have you seen the price of corn? High oh. fructose corn syrup and everything, right? So costs are soaring and that's getting pushed along. Then you got the supply chain stuff that's going on too. Then the other part is what we call demand pull, where you get too many dollars chasing too few of goods and that pulls inflation higher. Well, we got that too. Not only with all the, fret, the money printing that the government has done with the Fed, but now we're seeing that people are reluctant to return to work without substantially higher wages. That's what the last employment report showed. And in the response to that, Amazon, McDonald's, Home Depot, all these major companies have come out and said that they are going to start paying entry level people at $15 an hour. Just try to get people to come to work. Well, then that just exacerbates this demand pull stuff. Again, more dollars chasing too few of goods. So you got the double barrel, you got both of them going. So this inflation is not transitory. The Fed's gonna to continue to hold rates back, whether through job owning or adjusting that weighted average maturity or eventually just having to draw the line in the sand. And that keeps these real interest rates negative. 
negative real interest rates is the number one correlating factor for higher gold prices. And so there, you just kind of connect all the dots. You feel pretty good that I'm still on track to get my, my target that for this year, which was $2,300. And we said that back in January. I think you're going to be right. Uh, the only thing surprising to me is that the peak didn't already come in May. That's where the charts seem to indicate yeah. it was coming. But, uh, but we still got a few days left. You know, what I want to know, Craig, is, uh, is Flippy the burger flipper, the mm. burger making robot, is he going to demand, or she, I don't know, or maybe he's a non-determinant, maybe he's a binary, I don't know what the heck Flippy is, but is Flippy going to go on strike or refuse to work until he gets a raise or at least some more oil and uh, to ease his aching joints, Craig? That's what I want to know. <laughs> Picturing the Tin Man working <laughs> in an out burger. Um, no, that's, those are all valid points. And uh, I guess at the end of the day, I, I'll just kind of fall back on just what we know has happened in the past, that the Fed, when we got to this level of GDP to debt back after World War II, the Fed instituted yield curve control in a hope that they could grow their way out of it. Just grow GDP faster than the debt was growing and get that percentage back down. You do that by issuing all this cash, right? Inflating away the debt is what they call that. They're going to try it again. They admitted last June at the June FOMC that they'd studied it and were thinking about it. Uh, they're telling us now they know inflation is going to remain high. And they know, they know, again, Carrie, and we've talked about this so many times, but we're already paying $450 billion a year in interest on the national debt. And that's at, you know, $30 trillion at 1.5%. Well, if that goes to 3%, that's $900 billion, right? I mean, that, that line item gets out of control pretty fast, not even addressing corporate debt, state debt, municipal debt, personal debt, Pretty. mortgage loans, I mean, credit cards. I mean, they just can't allow it. So, right. Right. so if I might summarize what you're saying, um, I have about a uh, little bit more than two years to go till I could collect uh, some social security. And based on what you're telling me, it's not going to be worth much. <laughs> Do I have that right? Well, see, and again, Carrie, that's all part of this, the scam. I mean, Alan Greenspan went before Congress in 1992, that was a long time ago, and said, look, if, if we don't adjust how we calcula calculate inflation, then this entitlement of Social Security is just going to absolutely blow us away with, through the cost of living adjustments, right? If they had not done that, and we were actually quoting inflation at 8 10% a year, instead of the $2,500 a month you're going to be getting in a, you know, in a couple of years, you'd be getting like eight grand. Yeah, well, well they, they, how can they ever afford that? So when people sit there and they go, how is it that they can say the CPI is only two and a half percent? Well, because they do it deliberately that that's done for a reason. And so, yeah, I'm sorry. But hey, why, why don't we do this, Gary? Rather than me paying all my taxes, you can opt out of Social Security and I'll just cut you a check. You know, like I, I could do that. We could do we'll it. Cut out the middleman. Can we do it next week? Yeah, we'll start next week. Perfect. Because I'm ready to retire now. <laughs> One other thing I'd like to point out, you and I had this conversation a couple of times over the past few months, rising copper prices, yeah. right? Last right. March, copper crashed to less than three bucks a pound. And now it's hit records uh, over the past couple of weeks, 480 and change a pound. And it's going higher, no doubt. Yeah. Now the brilliant economists out there, Craig, said, Oh, well, that's because the economy is recovering, China recovery. And I just said, you know, maybe they see a recovery, but I sure don't. I think we are seeing the beginnings of commodity price inflation. And also all of our base metal prices were going up as well. The Chinese aren't doing it much better, Craig. They're upset over rising commodity prices. So what are they doing? They're shooting the messenger. Because mm -hmm. effectively, if you're in business and you increase your prices because you're compensating for higher prices that you're paying, you are a messenger of inflation. You are not the cause, but the Chinese, they really get off on shooting the messenger. Yeah, not just messengers. They shoot just about everybody. Yeah, well, anybody who's in the way, <laughs> in the perceived way. But, well, you know, well, my point hey. is, like, we didn't cause the inflation. We might be taking advantage to open up our margins a bit, and increase our profitability, but we didn't cause this inflation. You did. Yeah. And, and you know, Carrie, I'll just relate it back to the metals. 
Uh, and yeah, copper prices, iron ore prices, lumber, they've all pulled back a little bit. I mean, you can't just go straight up all the time. That never happens. But I will point out, <clears throat> copper being at basically all-time highs, the last time we saw levels like this was back in early 2011. And I emphasize early 2011 because copper rallied all from out of nine all through 2010 to about January 2011. Well, what came along about six, eight months later? Silver hitting all-time highs. Gold then going to what had been an all-time high. So let's just see where we go in the months ahead with the, in terms of the precious metals. I think we'll leave it at that. We covered a lot of ground here. Make sure you go over to tfmetalsreport.com. Sign up for Craig's newsletter and his service while you're at it, uh, you know, for basically uh, less than a cost of uh, inflation adjusted Starbucks. Uh, <laughs> you can subscribe to, uh, to the forum and highly recommend it. And Thank send you. us an email for Craig, whatever you have on your mind, kl at kerrylutz.com. Don't forget, sign up for our newsletter, Financial Survival Network. Craig, always a pleasure. Thanks so much for coming on. All the best, my friend. Good to see you.